So our studies for conference this week are a continuation of talking about the brain, the three brains, reptilian, mammalian, and the neocortex, and all about really um, consumption, like what are we taking in, what are we consuming, and what we, who we hang out with, what we read, what we listen to, what we're doing and looking at um, our lives as sort of energy and, and doing energy financing and, and making some decisions and choices around that to have some good um, financial energy planning. Last week we talked about what we consume and how we sift through that. Each person's very individual to create like our actions and how we show up for life. So this week we're starting with a quote by this guy named Bob Marley. And he said, Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. No one else can free your mind. We all know that quote, right? So back to what we are consuming in two areas that you guys, you guys take care of every time you do yoga. One is your mental muscle. No one else can free your mind. It's all about the choices you make to control your own thinking. And then the second one is your, your physical body, right? You're, we make decisions and do things like yoga. We do a million chaturangas and ashtanga so that we create a muscle memory. We create muscle and also muscle memory that allows us to freely and, and gracefully do chaturanga, right? So those two things are what we're constantly working on and um, and a lot of times, kind of making decisions around those unconsciously. So this is uh, a lot for us this week, and this study is about making decisions about how you will expend that, that energy. So if we think about, I'm gonna start with the physical aspect. If you think about muscle memory, what you've created muscle memory in, um, I, I've oftentimes noticed that people are naturals at Ashtanga or yoga when they have done gymnastics or we say tumbling when they were younger, right? Because even though I have a student that just did a drop back the other day from standing and she hadn't done anything like that in over 30 years, maybe closer to 40 years. And she just did it because her body remembered doing it and remembered what that felt like and so she could do it. But oftentimes, you know, if we don't have memory of something, uh, there's no pathway to that, then it's, then it's a long process for us to learn that. So one of the things we're talking about this week is um, the process of learning, creating a pathway in the mind and creating um, cellular memory. So we're kind of talking about that whole idea in outliers of 10,000 hours, right? Is one way is just do it, do it, do it, like Patabi Joyce says. 99% practice, 1% theory. You just gotta do it over and over again. So the example I used on Sunday was Bakasana B, which we don't actually do in this class, so I switched the example to be a handstand, because you guys do handstands in this class. Now, I could totally lose my microphone doing this, but if you didn't do gymnastics when you were younger and I say, hey, Peter, do a handstand in the middle of the room, what happens? What happens when you don't have any muscle memory of doing a handstand in the middle of the room, you do this. It's what everybody does. What am I doing? <laughs> yeah. Right, so our bodies are designed to survive. And, and there's all these mechanisms, both emotionally and physically, to protect ourselves. So if I don't have any muscle memory of doing a handstand in the middle of the room, to just randomly ask one of you to do that is, it's almost impossible, you know, because our, we're designed not to, right? We're designed to check, check, check all the systems are in place so that you don't. So what happens naturally then is rather than kicking all the way up, I stay much lower, like in this, this zone here is sort of the safety zone. If my hips don't go up past my shoulders, then I'm safe, right? But once your hips start going up past your shoulders, all the mechanisms start going off and danger, danger, the red lights are flashing and, and we, we come down, right? 
So one of the ways that I train you guys, the, the 10,000 hours in Ashtanga, is practice, 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 practice. But if you don't have a way to challenge yourself past what you normally would do, you could probably do what she called donkey kicks for years and never still be able to do a handstand in the middle of the room, right? So with practice also comes this idea of challenging yourself a little bit to train yourself to do something different. So if my, what part of my brain keeps me in the safety zone? Yes, the reptilian, the fight or flight part of my brain is like, we don't do this. So I'm trying to bypass that with you guys. And this is a technique that I always teach when I teach handstands. Look between your hands and you're gonna, this is why I always count to three. You're gonna reach up three times. The first one, you're gonna float the back leg. The second one, you're just gonna float the back leg. And on the third one, you may come up by reaching your second leg up rather than just hurling yourself over. Eventually you'll be able to do that, right? If I overshoot it, I teach you guys to do a cartwheel on the side of the room. And this method teaches you to get your hips in a more safe way to start moving where they need to move and we kind of break a pattern. We break a safety or a survival pattern that way. And the other day, she's not here today, but I had someone that's been doing that for a while and I. She was doing the hurling herself a handstand, which wasn't working. And so I taught her this technique. And I would say a couple months later, for the first time, she just balanced in the middle of the room. She was so excited, you know? Have you guys ever had that experience before when you've tried something and you're like, I'm never gonna be able to do this. I'm never gonna be able to do this. And then one day you do it. And it, that's one of the beautiful things about yoga because we do that physically a lot of times in yoga and what we realize is what we believed we couldn't do if we just tried it and tried it and tried it and took a new technique that took a little courage and pushed ourselves a little bit, all of a sudden we were able to do something we never believed that we could do at some point. You know, and that's, and that's some of the beauty of what I'm talking about physiologically that also happens for us with our mental muscle as well. So, and by the way, I'm gonna have you guys all start doing that technique for your handstands today. It's probably do one, two, three, and don't even try to come up to the third one. But on the third one, if you overshoot it, the cartwheel is really a brilliant because it's basically about falling. So once you guys can actually master falling, be comfortable falling, your body will know that it's gonna survive. And someday you can do a handstand in the middle of the room. So I do handstand workshops, I call them falling workshops. So you have to master falling first. But there's a beautiful metaphor in that, you know? So let's switch over now to the mental muscle that we're always working on is controlling the mind and keeping the mind strong and where we want it. So there's something called neuroplasticity. We actually talk about that a lot here in um, our classes. And neuroplasticity has to do with what? How does that work? The mind is plastic. What is it? Yeah. So it has to do with the neural pathways, right? And, and where we send those neurons down. And what we understand now is so simple and yet so profound is that wherever I send my mind, if I do that habitually, like training my chaturangas, like doing the handstand every day, every day, 10,000 hours, whatever I'm thinking, thinking, thinking every day, I create a pathway like, a, like a, a path through, you know, the forest. I create a pathway that I may have been thinking initially when and I started to create that pathway, but if I think that long enough, long enough over and over, eventually it becomes part of the reptilian system, right? It's automatic. So uh, we can look at that in examples I've talked about in the last few weeks, like being worried or stressed all the time. You know, it's like if you're worried every day about this worried about this every day, worried about this every day, worried about this, that thing goes away, then you're worried about something else, you're worried about something else. What you don't realize is your brain is learning something. It's learning to be very, very good at worrying to the point where you become an expert at worrying. And without even realizing it, your brain chooses that. You could just be listening to the news and something comes up and the next thing you know, you're gonna be worried about the state of our country you know, our destiny as a planet, you know, and get yourself all worked up and worried about it. For some ways it's real, but. So this, uh, this teaching for us to think about a little bit is those two things are constantly at play and we're 
we're always making choices around what we want to become an expert in, physically and also where we, how we want to train our mind, what you want to become an expert in the mind. Just those two simple choices that I always use is like either being a stress monkey and worrying all the time or choosing gratitude. Doing a gratitude practice every day, every day, every day means that my brain naturally goes to, I'm lucky, I'm blessed, because that's what I train my brain to do every day. I take time for that. So what I want you guys to think about this week is, um, so I want to give you a little bit of homework, which I guess I have to give you now. It's, um, it's this idea of where we put our attention. So one of the examples I gave is that I, I'm very comfortable public speaking. You know, but when I was younger, I wasn't a natural. When I was younger, I was petrified of it and cried. And I went to a Catholic school and I cried so much the nuns wouldn't make me do it. But now after teaching over the years and years and years of standing up in front of people and giving lectures and teaching yoga, now I love to do it. At the confluence, we had 300 people for the women's panel and I was so excited. I'm like, how long do I get to talk, right? I just loved it. But I had to practice that. It wasn't natural for me. So I want all of you to think that's an example of me right now. I want you all to think of one thing. It's the first thing that comes to your head that you're really, really good at. That someone might even say, you're an expert at that. Has everyone got it? It should be like, yes, there's this one thing I'm really good at. So we can kind of trace back, and maybe you were sort of a natural at it, but maybe no matter what, you really cultivated that by practicing, by challenging yourself at not being good at something, for by be willing to fail. I love last week's quote when Casper says, um, follow your passions, dive in and see where it takes you. Fall as much as you can and indulge in the learning experience. That's like handstands, but that's just life. Like learn how to fall, be comfortable with falling and really enjoy that you're not good at something. You know, that process of becoming good at something. So I am not a financial planner, but I would consider myself kind of a spiritual or energy planner. Would you not say that that could be part of my profession? Mm -hmm. This week, um, and Mary, I'm sorry, I, I, I left the quotes in the back so you'll have to bring those on down as you always do. If I could, if I had enough time this month, what I would love to do is have a private session with each one of you. And instead of planning out how you're gonna spend your money being a financial planner, what I would do is, is look at your life and look at how you spend all the energy in your life. What, what, how much time do you spend doing things and how much time do you spend thinking about things? And I would love to work out with each one of you to free up some energy that all of you have um, and to, to ask all of you to consider investing that in something new, something you haven't done before, something that you would like to be good at. You know, to spend that, that I'm calling it $1,000. I'm giving all of you $1,000 of energy today. And what will you do with that energy? How are you gonna spend it? So I asked this question on Sunday, and one of my students, who most of you know, um, she's a beautiful um, yoga practitioner in her 70s, and may, in her life right now, um, has her husband who has a very serious um, illness. And at the same time, her son is graduating from medical school and also getting married. And um, she spends a lot of her time caring for her husband, of course, right now. And she told me after class that she's gonna spend her $1,000 of energy on dance lessons with her husband. And she said, because he's not well right now and on a lot of medications and stuff, she needs the dance instructor to come right to their house. And so on Monday, the dance instructor came to their house to teach them how to dance for her son's wedding, even though her husband's sick and everything. And she said he had the best time. So she sort of knew she would. It was unexpected. He had the best time. And she said for once he wasn't thinking about like the medication or the, you know, how he wasn't feeling well. I kind of pulled him out of all that. And he just had a wonderful time and, and asked like when the dance instructor was going to come back. So I think she's a beautiful, just inspiration for all of us to think like, 
out of the box, you know, if you were given this extra time, this extra energy, what would you do with that? That's your question for this week. And Mary has our quotes. So of course the first quote is by Bob Marley and the second quote is by Patanjali. I thought this was a good combination. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. No one but ourselves can free our minds. And Patanjali said this, when you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations. Your consciousness expands in every direction and you find yourself in a new, great and wonderful world. Dormant forces, faculties and talents become alive and you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever dreamed yourself to be.